situation here in the United States. After all, the hog industry, as Alan has already indicated, is a worldwide industry, and all of us are affected by major developments no matter where they occur throughout the world. The area of the world with the most hogs, of course, lies in Asia. And it's in that area that we probably have the most limited information based primarily on the fact that we have limited information out of China as well as out of Russia. But we do have information on some other countries, some other sections of that area of the world, and I'd like to touch upon some of those. In Malaysia, for example, the pig sector of the livestock industry has been expanding at a rate of about 6% per year for the last decade. And hogs now account for nearly a third of the total value of all livestock produced. Hog production in Malaysia is highly commercialized, and most of the commercialization has occurred very recently. It's not unusual to run into units there that are producing from five to 30,000 hogs per year. One of the reasons for this is a liberal import policy which they have had, which uh, has enabled them to import extensively breeding stock from the United States and from Western Europe. They also, of course, have government-sponsored uh, artificial insemination service, which uh, enables them to get uh, semen of superior boars, and this has helped uh, materially to improve the genetic makeup of their herds. Malaysia and, and that section of the world, like many other sections of the world, of course, still have some serious disease problems, and particularly swine fever, which has been a, a problem in many areas of the world this past year. Periodic outbreaks of these diseases cause high mortality and often seriously disrupt the growth of an industry in a country. One other interesting area is Hong Kong with a land population, uh, a people land population ratio that's probably the highest in the world. It still produces about 12% of its annual uh, hog requirement. And I figured this out to come to be about 8,700 hogs per day, that 12%. The remainder at the present time uh, comes from China rather than from the United States. China itself, of course, is the world's largest producer of hogs, and we're only now beginning to learn a little bit about what goes on there. Reference has already been made to Japan and the fact that it is a, a growing area of hog production. Taiwan has probably been growing even more rapidly, uh, and the reason for the rapid growth in Taiwan has been basically their importing of breeding stock and technology from the United States, and there are some huge operations now uh, in Taiwan, and most of the operations there, the commercial operations, are, are very uh, highly commercialized. Western Europe, of course, is the area of the world which has long been the forefront of scientific development and hog production. The economies of a lot of countries depend primarily on their ability to produce pork and to export it at lower cost than anybody else. Consequently, this has meant great emphasis on scientific development, particularly on developments of breeding, feeding, confinement rearing, and it's from this area of the world that most of the ideas that are applicable to the United States producer come. Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Belgium, Holland, West Germany, France, all of these countries have very sophisticated, highly developed hog industries. In addition to that, of course, England, which we don't consider a part of the continent, but which is nevertheless a part of Western Europe, is a vital factor in the hog industry. Producers in this area of the world do a lot of things well. I have seen records, a number of records, not just an isolated record, where uh, farmers are able to, to market as many as 19, 18 to 20 hogs per sow. We had some figures up here a while ago on how many pigs we save per sow. Their sows are not only prolific, but they have 
been bred uh, and acclimated well to confinement life so that they make exceptional mothers. In addition to the number of pigs that they're able to get out of a sow, they are also doing some interesting things in the area of feeding, which gives them some uh, very exciting feed ratios. They're not blessed with the corn and soybeans that we have in this country, and so as a result, they have experimented a little more with other uh, feed formulas and with other feed techniques. Um, one of those techniques that we hear a lot about these days is wet feeding. I, I recall very vividly the first issue of Pig American that came out had an article on wet feeding, and it hardly got on the in the hands of our readers until I started getting phone calls wanting to know about a wet feeding of hogs. Well, it was fortunate that they called me because having grown up in Kentucky, I was one of the original wet feeders. Uh, I had a bucket in each hand. Uh, so, But they were talking about a little different concept, and so I, uh, I had to vary from the thing that I was most experienced with. But we have much to learn from Western hog producers. And they, have, in turn, of course, have a lot to learn from us. In the morning session, Alan mentioned a conversation between some people in his office, one from Germany and one from Canada, and some of the differing opinions they have uh, on technology. So that it is a two-way street, but we do have things that we can learn from them. And that's an unusual situation for American farmers to be in, because normally we have been in the forefront of whatever it is that we're doing. I realize that I'm doing a little more than just touching on the, the highlights of some of these areas. And even so, I don't want to stop without talking a little bit about uh, Latin America. Uh, Latin America has tremendous potential, I feel, in hog production. Already Brazil is just slightly behind the United States in terms of total hogs produced. I had the opportunity of being in Brazil in September of this year, and it's a fascinating country. Like the United States, almost everything about Brazil is big. It is a, I think about fourth or fifth, somewhere along there, in terms of total land area of all the countries in the world. Uh, it's just slightly smaller than the United States. Sao Paulo, which is uh, the largest city in Brazil, is also the third largest city in the world ranking ahead of New York City, if you can believe that. And anytime I'm in New York, I think it'd be impossible for anything to be spread out anymore. But it is, you fly into New York and you see the downtown area and those skyscrapers in a very confined area, and you fly into Sao Paulo and you fly over areas like that for what seems like uh, a long stretch of time. It is a huge, huge city. It's a country of almost unbelievable resources, and you hear a lot of a lot about that from time to time. 70% of the population of Brazil is under 30 years of age. It's just, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine being in a country where you see that many young people. If they ever get their political act together down there, which they haven't done yet, I guess, uh, Brazil has a fantastic future. The Brazilian pig industry, being uh, the size it is, it's kind of hard to believe when you first see those figures, and I think some of the breakdown that I can give you will help you better understand that. In the first place, you can divide the Brazilian hog industry into about four main sections. And the first one of these is uh, uh, accounts for about 30% of the national herd, and it is a, a, a group of producers or a group of uh, I don't know whether you call them producers or not, but it's a section of the industry where there's no modern technology applied at all. The pigs live on waste, they're outside, they're wild, and they look a little different, almost the same, as the ones that came over in the 16th century with the first settlers. There is another group, a second group estimated at about 30% of the nation's hogs, and these are backyard enterprises run by families who make some attempt to grow some feed and to control some diseases, but not much. And of course, it's the next two groups that really concern us. The third group, consisting of about 30% again, 
is made up of producers employing outside labor, fairly up-to-date rations and technology. They produce purebreds and crosses, and they have healthy and correctly managed facilities. And this is a major section of the Brazilian pork industry. And finally, there is the fast-growing group that experts tell us, made up of, it's a small group, no more than 10%, maybe slightly less, made up of producers using the most advanced methods of housing and management. They have hybrids or high quality purpose bred crossbreds, and that is a fast, the fast growing end of the business according to observers there. There's no doubt in my mind but that hog production in Latin America and particularly in Brazil will be coming on very strong in the years immediately ahead. And I think we'll see them competing directly with us in foreign markets, particularly as we attempt to expand exports of our pork products. They are already ex exporting broilers, broiler meat. As you well know, they're exporting soybeans, and it's only a matter of time until they start competing in the foreign markets with exporting pork. It's difficult to talk about some of these uh, areas uh, without winding up just describing what's going on there. And yet the important thing is what does it mean to us? How are we affected by what goes on in these sometimes remote areas? And there was a time when these areas seemed very remote to me, yet the world is a very small place anymore. It, uh, is no longer true that we can assume because something is halfway around the world it doesn't affect us. The things transpiring in Asia, Africa, Europe, or even Latin America are a vital part of our everyday lives. A crop failure in Asia, an outbreak of foot and mouth disease in England, oil embargo by the OPEC nations, trade restrictions, all these things get directly related to your farming operation. And that's a vast change from what it used to be only a few years before. The hog industry has become a worldwide industry too. Its growth in size and complexity make it very difficult for any of us to properly weigh all of the factors which affect our very livelihood. And yet we know that if we are going to compete, we have to know what's going on in this area of the world. And that's one of the things that complicates your life as a pork producer. Now the company which I represent devotes its effort trying to be helpful in these areas. It was for this purpose that we established Pig International and Pig American magazines. The editorial staffs of these publications span the globe picking up information on economic developments, technological breakthroughs, and improved practices in order that this information can be available to the people who need it. And as important as I feel that is, I recognize that it's only a very small part of the picture. One of the biggest problems that you have as a producer is to find the time, particularly the time to even be familiar with all of the things going on that affect you very vitally. And that's one of the reasons that an organization such as you have here is of such vital importance to you in the years ahead. You have your own group of experts in the hog division of NFO. These people spend all of their time analyzing and trying to uh, suggest responses for the things that are going on, not only in the United States, but wherever they may be occurring. And they have a bit more time than you have to look at all of the facts and try to put them together. I'd like to say that to my knowledge, no other organization dealing with farmers has come even close to what this organization has in putting together a staff of experts. I was in at your meeting in Des Moines in August, and I think one of the, the most impressive things to me at that meeting was to see the staff of people that your organization had put together to serve you in the vital areas of your interest, in areas that as individuals you, 
really can't do very well for yourself, and yet you have uh, the best in the business working for you. So it's important that you not only support the staff of the hog division, but that you pay attention to what they have to say, because these are the people who are going to be best informed, simply because that's what they spend their working hours doing. The old world has just become a bit too complicated for each of us to be an expert in everything. So with your support and with your uh, cooperation, I'm sure that the group that you've assembled to assist you in this area of the hog division will cause your opportunities to be almost limitless. I know you have had and will continue to have a number of people on your program who will explain far more eloquently than I could uh, where we've been, where we're going in the, not only the farm field but also in the hog business. So I don't want to, it's neither necessary nor desirable for me to try to add to what they might have to say. Rather, just let me say this to you. If while you're here in St. Louis, you hear someone say that hogs may very well be the brightest picture in all of ag animal agriculture in the decade ahead. I hope you will put me down as believing it too. And if someone says that we've only scratched the surface so far as progress is concerned, not only in the production of hogs but also in the marketing of pork, I hope that you will tell them that I believe it even stronger. And if someone tells you that to be successful, in the hog business, we have to find ways to compete effectively with the best hog producers throughout the world. Tell them that I agree. Now, I know that this kind of accomplishment can't be done without effort, without sacrifice, but you know better than anyone else that you didn't get where you are now with, by resting on your past accomplishments. There's no reason to think that you're gonna make further advances with less effort. But I think you know and I know people who will put forth the necessary effort, who will make the necessary sacrifices, who will contribute the ideas, the enthusiasm, and the leadership to make these accomplishments possible. And while it may be difficult at times to measure each one of these steps individually, collectively, they can change the face of the earth before our very eyes. Yours is a noble and essential occupation. No one has done more for mankind during my lifetime than the American farmer. It's a pleasure for me to be a part of this industry and to have this opportunity to appear on the program of your excellent convention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cockrell. Uh, we're faced with a situation and it seems it always happens to the afternoon meeting. Uh, the Secretary of Agriculture is going to be in the main convention hall in a matter of a few minutes. They're thinking that he'll be there at about a quarter of four, so about 3.30 we're going to have to adjourn to move in that general direction. Uh, how much time does that give me, Merle? Okay, we'll wind this up in in 15 minutes here and then go on. If you have some questions on some things that I tell you that are not answered, we'll have to get together at the, at the hog booth uh, later on in the course of the uh, convention. In looking at, at this, we have built the hog department's program as the nation's most complete marketing and bargaining program. Now that sounds pretty wild sometimes, and you may you may think that we're out here in, in orbit when we talk about that, but I want to tell you some of the things that you have accomplished in that program. At this point in time, we have been advertising in the Pig America magazine. We have stepped up that advertising program to include the National Hog Farmer. We have set up a, a radio program. We've made about, oh, maybe 25 or 30 cuts of the hog spot radio tapes that are going to be available and which should become a part of the program sometime in the future. We have the ability to grade hogs, to put them on live merit, sort them, and to forward contract hogs. Plus, 
we can take and do about anything that the industry can do, and yet we have the concept of collective bargaining and a basic contract to start from to write a floor price or cost of production price. Now, on that basis, when we look at it historically, since 1976, when we started on this program, we came on first with a commitment to bargain. It was an inventory of 7,000 people that believed it could happen. With the working with those people, we have developed the program that we're looking at now. We negotiated supply contracts. As I stand before you here today, you have a contract with Wilson and Company signed Wednesday last week. You have one with Armour and Company. You have one with Morrell. There's a proposal in the hands of Fredericks. And Tuesday of this week, we met with an agent of two Eastern Packers on a supply of hogs in that contract. There are some 30 loads a week. Now, this has been made available to you by your efforts. In addition, we want to take the large uh, load lot shippers and set up a program of conference calls, well, not only with the large shippers, but with everyone else because we have put in a phone system your home office that we could hook 10 or 12 of you together on one phone system you could talk to each other now if you were talking with someone on the west coast somebody on the east coast and everyone in between you would know exactly where the soft markets were developing and it puts you in a position to take and move those hogs in the direction it's going to support your market in 1979, we're looking at additional hogs coming to market. You're going to hear a lot of people talking about breaking the, the price. Uh, we hear them talking about $40 hogs now. We don't have to have that happen. If we continue to build like we have and stabilize our programs, we're in position to protect that, mi that market well into the fall of 79. We have to see what will happen then. We may have to use some other measures, but there is no reason to see a weakening in the hog price. I think I can honestly say that I can go to the economists, we can take the statistics, and I think I can prove that this organization, through their contracts, have stabilized the hog market over the last two years. All the economists and experts that were predicting hog markets in numbers, well, they got the numbers pretty close. But when they started predicting the prices, they missed those by as high as $10. At the Independent Meat Packers uh, Convention, the man told them that their hogs were going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of $35 to $36. And folks, that never happened. That was one of the advisors to that group. I attend a meeting in Chicago at the American Meat Institute. And this one meeting, to say it real short because we're pressed for time, we had a man ask the question, or the address the question, with about 60 packers present, what is wrong with the hog industry? Well, they talked a little bit about cost of production, feed costs, procurement costs. When asked about uh, merchandising and increasing their merchandising program, here the people got apprehensive about that. Finally, the economist and advisor to that group got up and says, well, you're going to have to pay less money for your raw product. The hog prices have got to go down. That's what's wrong with the industry. Well, I asked him, why do we have to put the market down to the farmers? And they told me this. They says that this is the line of least resistance. Now think of that. That was one of the economists, or one of the people that was advising these packing plants on how to make their industry more profitable by lowering the price to the farmer. Well, the logic of that isn't sound because if you lower the price to the farmer and the farmers go out of business, you've got no hogs to kill. But by the same token, think of what that does to your cash flow. That concept. That is why we must organize so we have the same economic strength that those people have. Can you imagine what would happen? And I'm going to challenge the industry, and I challenge our industry reps here, this. If the market is going to go down 5 or $10, what would happen if they put 5 to $10 additional money per hundredweight 
in the merchandising program. Now, man, there would be a promotion, huh? That's right. We have got to price it if we're going to have a stable agriculture. At this point in time, we have taken these supply contracts. We have improved them. We've gone to the hog contract for NFO members, which is a, a nothing more than a concept to give the negotiators the ability to move the hogs in the direction that they return the most dollars. That's what that means. Now we're in the process of negotiating with various companies on a floor price uh, proposal and a floor price uh, amendment to our contracts that should result in a floor price contract. It's going to take some numbers. Now a floor price contract is nothing more than the average cost of producing hogs. However, don't assume that that's a cure-all. Because as we stand in this room today, you could have some people with $36 hogs uh, and some with $56 hogs and everything in between. The floor price is an average cost and you cannot use it as a cure-all by any stretch of the imagination. I want to talk to you for just a couple of minutes about the program and then we have got a, we've got a drawing here we want to deal with. The live merit sales, the grader will assist the producer in determining which way his hogs should be marketed to return the most dollars to the producer. That's what we're talking about, live merit. In the grade and weight sales, the grader will assist the producer in determining what type of hogs will give the best results. These graders are available. I'm going to identify and introduce some of those in a few minutes. In addition to those two programs, you have a forward contracting program which allows the producer the flexibility to lock in a predetermined price without having to mess around with the margin and margin calls. It's a cash sale. It is not a speculative hedge. In other words, uh, you, would mark, you would price your hogs at that particular time, and when you delivered them, those would be the dollars that you would receive. At any rate, the bottom line of this is that our staff will assist you in the designing a total marketing and bargaining program that will fit your operation. I want the members of the, of the convention staff that we brought down from the home office to stand. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about them. Uh, and I'm going to start right over here with Roger Blank. Roger Blank is in charge of negotiating. He had spent uh, about 28 years with Wilson and Company. He was in charge of their fresh pork procurement division. From there, he took on the fresh pork uh, sales division and left that position to become the manager of the plant at Mammoth, Illinois. He is in charge of negotiations. His partner in that department is Harley McLeod, who has approximately 24, 26 years uh, with Morrell, John Morrell and company uh, out of Ottumwa. That's where his home base was. Uh, Merle Sunken, who is my assistant, was a hog producer from Ohio. He had about 12, 1,400 head of hogs 12, 13 years ago. He spent a lot of time with negotiations. Uh, he was a feed salesman and a producer, and he got himself back in the hog business now. And I guess we're going to have to label him one of those in and outers, you know. Bill, <laughs> Bill Talbert is standing over there by the door. He run a, a feeder pig operation. He had somewhere around five to 7,000 head of, of feeder pigs up in northeast Iowa. Uh, he's been very successful in developing the program, uh, doing a real outstanding job on that. Cecil Conry is a farrow to finish operator. And uh, this is Cecil over here down in uh, southwest Iowa. And he is working with your, your hog department there. Uh, so, on that basis, these people are here to serve you, to assist them. And I think I could just say this, all the hog staff that's in the meeting, the other ones, stand up. 
I don't know if, how many we got here. There's one way in back. That's Jack Moore way in the back. He was a regional petroleum salesman working in sales. He works in Illinois. Ken Schwering was the assistant head buyer at Farmland Industries that came with us. Wayne Leedy fed to kill at Marhofer Pack for 17 or 18 years. Dave Chase was an assistant to the manager of the Reynolds Steel Farm at Henderson. In addition to those people in the meeting this morning, I forgot to introduce Ernie Snyder, who was with uh, the Select Meats. He came with us some time ago. We've got Clarion Hansen from the commission firm in Sioux City, Jim Waddell from Oscar Meyer, Dick Hansen from Oscar Meyer, uh, Gene Henning from the Omaha Yards, plus a number of, of additional people. So with that staff, these people are hired for one purpose, and that is to design a marketing bargaining program or to work with you to design that marketing bargaining program. If there is a problem in the marketing and bargaining and negotiating of hogs, I want you to sit down with these people and work it out. They're not going to be right 100% of the time, and we can't expect that. But they certainly can do this. You've got to recognize that on the other side, there's as many people to buy those hogs as cheap as they can because there is not one plant manager and ask any one of these industry reps, ask Blank if he gave away Wilson's money to pay more money to farmers, ask Leedy if he did it for Marhofer, ask Schwering if he did it for farmland. You don't hire a man to buy expensive hogs, you hire him to buy cheap hogs. We hired these people to represent us so that we can sell the highest hogs in the country, so we can get the most dollars for our people. So use their knowledge, because they are, they are very capable in their respective fields. Now, at any rate, the program that we're talking about here has got to work for the producer. The Board of Directors has made it relatively simple to uh, become a member. You can become a member for one year, and at the end of that year, you would automatically be terminated from the membership roles. You'd have to rejoin. Here you see, here you see the collection points in the United States. To make these collection points work, we have coupled it with a structure that looks something like this. And I'm going to just run through it because we're up against the wall on time. We have the people that are going to be working the two county areas. And those of you that have got these sheets where we've asked you to commit yourself to talk to five people, you would be working with these two county men. Those hogs would be scheduled in with a salaried manager of five collection points. Now you're going to see some changes in the country because we're going to put one man in charge of five and make him responsible to handle it. We want to decentralize the management of the department considerably so that we can put more management into this area, thereby giving us greater flexibility in program. In addition to doing that, we've negotiated a, a service charge from the packing industry and hopefully in the next months we should be able to negotiate out all of the costs of the program. The industry could just as well pay for them because any time that you were to go to the post office, you have to pay for that stamp. Okay, if we put the hogs up for the industry, they should pay for it. If we're supposed to ensure their, their own bankruptcy, let them pay the cost of that insurance. We've got 15 cents for ink. That's our problem because we hired ink for collective bargaining. Uh, if we're going to have to pay the producers, then let those people pay that service cost. So we've reduced uh, the, the service charge in the country, and we're in the process now of negotiating uh, that out. But these units would report to a field supervisor who would be holding meetings periodically with each of the areas. So looking at this, we're going to have Merle take his, his uh, names, uh, and he will have to put them on the board at the, at the hog booth because we've just about run out of time. I see uh, one of the people from the convention staff coming over here, and uh, it's about that time. So at this point, 
Uh, enjoy the convention. We're going to go over and listen to Berglund. If you have any questions that you want asked of him, write them down, pass them to one of the people in the uh, audience over there, and they will get them up, up to the stage.